Hey everybody. Hey, last week I made a mistake in my video. I said that that would be the last week that we would be talking about the Old Testament. Uh, that was actually incorrect. See, we did get to the end of the Old Testament with Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Those are the last books in that, in that timeline of the Old Testament. Uh, however, I forgot that the curriculum actually does talk about the prophetic books and the poetic books. So this week we're going to be talking about the first poetic book, which is the book of Job. I love the book of Job. It teaches us a lot of things. I think the biggest thing that it teaches us is about lordship. Uh, when we say Jesus Christ, our Lord, what is it that we mean by that? Lord is, of course, just a, mean, a word that means the, the master or the person in charge, the king, the, the person who gets to make decisions, right? That's a Lord. Here's what, here's what Job teaches us. Job, Job exists and God says he's a righteous man, a good man. Oh, Job, he actually has a meeting with Satan and he says, Satan, have you seen my servant Job? Job is such a good man. He obeys me, he follows me, he's righteous, he's not a horrible person. There's no one like him on the earth. And Satan says, well, of course you've given him so much. Of course he anybody would listen to you if you just give him all these wonderful things. And God says, nope, even if they went away, Job, he's good. He would listen to me, he would still obey me. And so Satan actually winds up taking all these things from Job. To the point that Job's wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? See, here's the difference. Here's the difference between Job and his wife. For Job, God was his Lord. And so it didn't matter if he had good things from God or if he had bad things. That didn't matter because at the end of the day, either God's in charge or he isn't. And in the end, Job winds up asking God a series of questions. He says, God, I think, you, I think you made a mistake. You're punishing me when you think that I've done something wrong, but I haven't. So he thought God was punishing him when God wasn't punishing him. He just was allowing things to happen because bad things happen. And, and, and he allowed Satan to, to do what Satan does. But it wasn't a punishment. And so he starts questioning God. He never curses God like his wife says. He never says, then you won't be my Lord. You're not in charge. But he does say to God, hey, uh, I think you made a mistake here. Like kind of like a, a kid might say to his father or, or a, a, a person who has a king might say to the king, hey, you're making a mistake. Hey, you're, you're not right about this. I haven't done anything wrong. And in Job chapter 38, 1 through 7, I want to read this real quick to you. In Job 38, 1 to 7, God answers Job back. And he says this, Who is this that obscures my counsel by words without knowledge? Embrace yourself like a man and I will question you. God says, I'm going to question you now, Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who fixed its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? On what were its foundations set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. See, God starts talking about things that Job has no way to know anything about. He starts talking about creation. Where were you, Job, when I created the world? Where were you when I set its foundations? Where were you when I did all these things? God is trying to remind Job, hey, I'm Lord for a reason. I know what I'm doing. And either, either I'm able and worthy to be your Lord and make the decisions or I'm not. So tell me, are you better able to make decisions, Job? Were you there when I created? Were you there when all these wonderful things happened? Oh man, if you ever want to read a fantastic, fantastic chapter of the Bible, Job 38, God describes all these things to Job that he's done. And in the end, Job says, I was wrong to question you. You are Lord for a reason. I should have kept my mouth shut. I should have just followed you because you are worthy because you are God. God is Lord because he's God. 
or he's not Lord because you won't let him be. But he certainly deserves to be Lord. Not because he does everything that you would like to be done, right? That would make you Lord. If you're the one who should be in charge, you're Lord. But if God should be in charge, he's Lord. Here's what John 16, 33 says. Here on this earth, we will have many trials and sorrows. You're going to have rough times. You're going to have bad things happen. You are personally going to have bad things happen. There, there's no way around it. You're going to have sadness. Things aren't going to go your way. But Jesus says this, but take heart because I've overcome the world. You're going to have trouble in this world. You're going to have sorrow. You're going to be sad. Things aren't going to go right. Things are going to go horrible. But Jesus says, I've overcome this world and I'm in charge of it and I'll take care of you. The question is, will you be like Job's wife and reject lordship and say, nope, if I'm going to have trouble in this world, then you're not going to be my boss anymore. I'm going to do what I think should be done. I will be Lord. Or will you say, God, at the end of the day, you are God and therefore you will be my Lord. See, the Lord, Lord and God, they aren't the same thing. He can be God and still you reject him as the boss. But because he's God, you ought to make him your boss because he's overcome this world and because he has your best interest in mind because he loves you very deeply. Until next time, have a great week. Check out the Buck Denver videos that Kay sends out and I'll see you, uh, see you next week.